Hello, and welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency, devoted to promoting musicians and authors worldwide. Call us today at 941 877 one five five two to start your free publicity evaluation. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. Please welcome the host of Interviewing the Legends, music journalist, author, and entrepreneur, Ray Shasho. Hello once again, everyone. I'm your host, Ray Shasho, and welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends on BBS Radio, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call us today at 941-877-1552 or email us at publicityworksagency.com. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. Mike Panera, singer, guitarist, and songwriter, is known around the world as the driving force from legendary and iconic bands Iron Butterfly, Blues Image, Alice Cooper, and of course his solo work with Good Night, My Love. Panera formed the Blues Image and Tepa, a progressive blues band playing rare blues songs by iconic British blues bands. He and Blue's Image moved to Miami, where they were co-founders of the famous rock venue The Image in Miami Beach. Mike headlined and performed weekly with such legendary artists as The Grateful Dead, Eric Clapton and The Cream, Led Zeppelin, Jimi Hendrix, The Doors, and others. One year later, they moved to Hollywood, California. Mike uh, received a recording contract from Atlantic Records, where they had a huge hit with Ride, Captain, Ride, which Mike co-wrote and sang. Ride, Captain went to number three on the Billboard charts, earning a Platinum Record Award. Mike played in the Iron Butterfly, who received the first Platinum Record Award ever given to any artist. Iron Butterfly albums, which feature Panera, are Metamorphosis, one of my favorite albums, with Panera and Rhino. Of course, Rhino Reinhardt, a local favorite here in the Sarasota area, which hit number 16. Evolution, Best of Iron Butterfly, Light and Heavy, Inagata De Vita Laser Video Disc all featuring Mike. The uh, single Easy Rider, written by Panera, reached number 66 on the Billboard charts, making it the band's biggest hit aside from Inagata De Vita. The album is noted for having the first use of the guitar talk box, which Mike co-invented. During this time, Panera discovered and co-produced Black Oak, Arkansas on Atlantic Records, resulting in a multi-million seller, now multi-platinum. He and iconic Jimi Hendrix drummer Mitch Mitchell formed the band Ramatam, recording the album Ramatam. The group was acclaimed as a cutting-edge progressive rock band. In the mid-70s, Pinero joined Cactus. He and Ted Dugey went on a national tour together. They uh, turned their nightly jamming at the end of the shows into a climatic finale entitled The Guitar Battle of the Century. It was an exciting blend of high-energy playing, wrestling, and audience participation. In 1980, Mike joined up with longtime pal Alice Cooper for two world tours. In 92, Mike formed the first original classic rock supergroup, the Classic Rock All-Stars. The band included lead singers and stars from Rare Earth, our buddy Peter Rivera, Sugarloaf, Spencer Davis, uh, Headhunters, and himself. Special guests included members of Kansas, Toto, Almond Brothers, Steppenwolf, Moody Blues, and many others. They were the number one classic rock supergroup in the world. Please welcome legendary guitarist, singer, songwriter, producer, Mike Panera to Interviewing the Legends. Hello, Mike. Hello, Ray. How are you doing? Did I miss anything? <laughs> no. Oh, no. Uh, just, uh, well, some of the new things that I'm doing, but I'll, I'll get to that with you later. Okay. Well, let, let's, let's, let's do that now. What do you got going on? Well, I just completed uh, a new album called Timeless. And uh, it's a combination of the most requested songs of my career, and uh, includes uh, Ride Captain and Agata DeVita, and uh, you know, a lot, a lot of songs like that. And uh, <clears throat> it also uh, features a 40-piece orchestra. 
Wow. From Orlando. Really? Yeah. Man, you haven't, I tell you, you haven't lived until you've heard Rod Cap and Rod with a 40 piece orchestra behind it. Oh, and uh, Jonathan Kane from Journey, yeah. uh, founder and leader, right? He played on it. Thank you, Jonathan. And also Pat Travers played on it. Had a lot of great iconic players on that album, and that's called Timeless. Okay. And that's it's on uh, Cleopatra Records. And, you know, they're calling it uh, Blues Image and Mike Panera, and uh, that's fine with me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, that's okay. Because we've had a lot of requests to go out on tour and, and right. reunite the Blues Image uh, material because most of the guys are not playing anymore. Uh, but the uh, other thing that I've done, uh, Ray, that I find very interesting, and so do a lot of other people, is I've gotten into online video streaming for the folks that are quarantined right now. Right. And uh, I get the, you know, the the invites go out from the best guitar company in the world they're called Sawtooth uh -huh. and uh, they uh, sponsor me and they uh, they, have, they really do have the best gear I've got a guitar right now that I'm playing that hasn't even been released to the public yet it won't come out till this summer and it's got like seven pickups and you can get any combination of tones a Les Paul with a Stratocaster with a Telecaster I mean just unbelievable and they send the invites out and let people know that I'm going to be live online. So I did a show yesterday. It was the first one of its kind. It's called The Captain's Log. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, and I, I wear my captain's hat. You know, it's really, really cool. And so I play the sawtooth stuff, and I tell road stories. So <coughs> I, I really get a good feel for what people like of my career and the songs and whatnot. And so the chat replies are coming in as I'm talking, as I'm playing. And uh, from as far away as Japan and, and Germany and, uh, uh, you know, Sweden. <laughs> and uh, so it's really fun to, c to communicate with the fans and be able to talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. And then I take requests. You know, somebody will say, hey, can you play such and such a song, which I didn't think anybody even knew, like from the early, early blues image, right. 1966, right. 67. But, uh, and of course, they know a lot about my jams with Hendrix and John Bonham, uh, God rest their souls, uh, from Led Zeppelin. A lot of people that I jammed with, Greg Allman, uh, that I was very close with, actually, is more than jamming. And so they want to know what was that like and tell us about this. So it's a combination of what I call road stories and also some requests, musical requests. This is a great time for you to do that, too, because everybody's at home, they have nothing to do, you know, and they love music, you know, and it's it's a wonderful time for you to do that. Yeah. 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 You know, I was... I did, go ahead. Mm -hmm. go, go ahead. I just... So I did that yesterday for an hour and a half. It was only supposed to be 30 minutes. Right. <laughs> but we got carried away, so it was an hour and a half that I was on there. Now, are you, are, are you going to do more of these soon, or...? I'm, I'm doing them every Tuesday every at Tuesday. 3 p.m. Okay. On my Facebook page, I have a, an official fan page. Right. Aside aside from the timeline, and the official fan page has all the notices on there. We'll be doing it every when every uh, Tuesday at 3 p.m. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, 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 gosh, what is wrong with you? Um, Blackmore and uh, Candace were on there the other night from uh, uh from their house and they did a nice little concert from blackmore's night you know all the music from blackmore's night so that that was yeah. that was pretty cool too i i love it when you guys do things like that you know instead of you know just kind of stay home and sulk <laughs> you know? absolutely and next week i'm, I'm gonna invite a bunch of people uh, players and, and artists and friends. Oh, good. To, jo to join me live, yeah, you know, with the great. new uh, technology, you know, we can bring in people from other locations and have them all there, like on a Zoom yep. situation. You know, it looks like the Hollywood Square, but we've got our instruments and we're jamming together. So that's going to be real fun next week. That would be fantastic. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Definitely. Great. Yeah. You know, I was good friends with Joe Lala. <laughs> what a great guy he was. Yes, he Good was. Friend. We went to high school together. I know. He, you know, he talked all great things about you. Uh, he was my first interview. Uh, I hung out with him in his house. He wanted me to be his personal assistant, but I did get him somebody. 
uh, to help him out with all his issues and stuff. But yeah, yeah. he he was, he's a great guy, man. He he was a great guy. I I really miss him. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And he was a, a, a very integral person in the blues image because when I formed the band in Tampa, um, you know, we um, there was two guys that went to high school with me, right? And then Malcolm Jones, again, rest in peace. He got he had just gotten in from Wales, and so he was kind of ahead of the music scene while well, people in Tampa were playing. Uh, because your chewing gum loses flavor on the bedpost overnight. Yeah. And guys, guys like me were jamming and, and backing up people like uh, Bobby Blue Bland and right. uh, uh, R&B people, Cherry Butler and, uh, you know, Benny King. So there seemed to be like it, all the way to the left were the bubblegum guys, all the way to the right <laughs> were the R&B guys. But Malcolm came in and said, you know, there's a new wave of music coming in from Europe. England especially, and what it is, it's blues. It's the original blues as played by the pioneers, by John Lee Hooker and Muddy Waters and people like that, but they've turned it into something a little different by turning up their martial amps to 10 and getting this incredible distortion and stuff. And sure enough, he uh, he turned us on to that scene, and that's when Eric Clapton was part of uh, John Mayle and the Blues Breakers, Eric Burton had the animals, they were doing some great stuff, the Yardbirds were doing great stuff, and so it was Malcolm who led us that way, but then Joe, uh, he, he liked my idea of having two drummers. I said, let's do two drum sets, plus Joe, you play great Latin percussion. And so we did that. And man, I tell you, Ray, what a sound in the early blues image to hear two drummers playing like a Chicago shuffle. Exactly. In perfect sync. Yeah. You know, with the fills and everything. And uh, and Joe, when he would jump over his drums and come out and play Latin percussion on top of that, it gave us a sound like at that point nobody had. Well, we Jim, were the only ones to sound like that. Well, Jimi Hendrix said, "Blues Image was one of the best up and coming bands around." That's that's pretty good. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was very nice of him. Yeah, uh, that was a, a magazine article, and <clears throat> he also, besides that, he had done other uh, articles and stuff where he talked about how he loved coming in from the road and coming directly over to our club in Hollywood. California to play with us, and a uh, very nice man, you know, he, he would invite us over to his house after we jammed together, and he ended up giving me a guitar, he gave me his dobro, the one that he played on uh, all along the watchtower, mm-hmm. it's got all those slide sounds and stuff, he gave that to me, he's, wow. a he's just a great guy. How incredible is that? Well, oh, he- it, totally. Totally. Here's here's so something I, here's something I, I from my all, I, them all. I know I know here's something from my interview with Joe that he said about you okay I'm gonna uh-huh. read. we opened for acts like the Doors and Janis Stop Joplin you know all those big mothers when we yep. opened for Cream and Eric Clapton and the Yardbirds with Jimmy Page they'd go to the promoter and say how dare you book someone that good before us referring to lead <laughs> guitarist Mike Panera of Blues Image. Benero was imitate, uh, intimidating to other guitar players. Clapton told the promoter and came that close to saying he wouldn't go on after Panera. <laughs> <laughs> and you were that good, yeah. man. <laughs> well, you know, we had similar styles, uh, right. Clapton and I, with the blues thing, as well as with Carlos Santana. I had not really ever heard him play. And then someone said, that, you know, there's a group in San Francisco sounds just like you guys and in fact Mike your guitar playing is very much like his check them out they're called Santana and yeah we checked them out All right, we toured together we did pop festivals together had a lot of fun you know Santana and Blues Image were oh, like yeah. a, a major order uh, musical bill that we had a lot of fun with but I tell you uh, when I formed the Ramatam with Mitch Mitchell Jimi Hendrix's drummer uh-huh. we, we uh, discovered a girl guitar player yep uh, named April Lawton. Right. And God rest her soul. Uh, not many people left that I played with, but I tell you, she was phenomenal. She was a cross between, uh, Jimmy and also like John McLaughlin, you know, uh, heavy jazz and blues and, and fusion and stuff. And so Remitam went up and we were playing with groups like, uh, uh, Led Zeppelin, uh, 10 years after. Uh, Journey uh, was just forming back then, uh, Bob Seger, a lot of great bands. 
And it, it's amazing because it's like the whole thing had come around in a full circle. Because when we got out of Tampa, we moved to Miami. Right. And pe- people said to us in Miami, hey, man, why don't you just start your own club? Why play these little mm-hmm. these little bars and stuff? Because you guys are probably the best band in Miami. So why don't you see if you can find a place of your own? And oddly enough, there was a bowling alley <laughs> that came up for rent on Collins Avenue right. in Miami Beach. And we had some hippie friends who were contractors and, you know, they really knew their stuff. So they came in and tore the bowling alley there. All the lanes were gone. And we were uh, uh, there with uh, just, you know, concrete floor, concrete wall, roof. And then some other friends came in with sound and lights. And before you knew it, we had a theater. It was more than a club. It was really a theater right. that fit, fit like 1,500 people. Wow. And we called it The Image, you know, after the blues image. Yeah. It's called The Image, T-H-E-E. And opening night was Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention. Wow. And, and then Eric Clapton and the Cream came and uh, the Yardbirds with Jimmy Page. And that was a kind of funny story because uh, the people that were coordinating all the travel and stuff, they said, hey, man, we need somebody to go pick up uh, the Yardbirds at Miami International. Would you do it? I said, sure. So I went over and picked them up, and Jimmy came in, sat in my car, and he had a young kid with him. He looked like he was like, I don't know, 14 years old is what he looked like. And he kind of looked like he'd run away from home to go on the road with the Yardbirds. But anyway, Paige tells me, he says, I want to introduce you to my friend. His name is Steven Tyler. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. And so I met Steven then. I said, hey, man, how you doing? He said, oh, I'm a blues man, man. I, I, I sing and play the blues. And I, you know, I play blues harp. I said, yeah, sure you do. And, man, I was shocked when I heard him play. He is cool. You know, he was great. Yeah. So we went on the road. Uh, the Yardbirds and Blues Image did a bunch of gigs together. And then a couple of years went by. Three years, I guess it was. I saw Jimmy again, but now he was in a band called Led Zeppelin. Yep. And uh, I said, God, I remember Jimmy we played together back in Miami when you were in the Yardbirds. And I said, I'm just getting ready to join the Iron Butterfly, I tell you the truth. And, uh, you know, he understood, you know, what was going on. Because at that time, Ray, you know, a lot of bands were at the mercy of their record labels. Exactly. You know, you, you, you come home from playing like, a, I don't know, a couple hundred dates yeah. that year. And the guys that were married wanted to be with their family. They right. said, ah, finally home. But the record label would say, nope, you got to go back into the recording studio, record another album, and then we're sending you back out on the road. So <laughs> Blues Image uh, didn't fare very well with that, and the band started unraveling at the seams. Yeah. And right at that same time is when Iron Butterfly called me and said, we'd like you to be our new guitar player. You and another Floridian yep. by the name of El Rhino, Larry yes. Reinhardt. Yes. And I said, great, that's just in time. So uh, it, it turned out real well because my parents were very poor and they were in, on the verge of losing their house and everything. And I came from a band that was making $200 a week wow. to uh, a band that was making 20000 a month. Yeah. You know, so I was able to pay my parents' house off and... It all went very well. A lot of fans don't understand it to this day. You know, they, they say, you know, Panera left Blues Image and right after Right Captain Ride, they could have been so big. Right. But they don't understand what goes on behind the lines and why a lot of bands from the classic rock period broke up. Exactly. All over the place. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Especially from the 60s, because a lot of them never made that crossover into the 70s. You know? That's right. Yeah. That's right, Ray. Yeah. That, that's right. And a lot, a lot of bands, yeah, if, uh, John Fogarty had stayed with uh, Creedence exactly. Clearwater, and if uh, yeah. Three Dog Night had you know stayed with the original singers and stuff, yeah, we had some yeah. incredible uh, bands out there. But uh, man, it's really rough when when you know you got a number one record and you're selling out stadiums like forty thousand people yeah. with other bands, and you know you go to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> and your manager hands you a check for 200 bucks I know. for the week, and you go, wait a minute, what's this? They go, well, don't you know how this business works? That's you right. have to pay back all your expenses exactly. from the uh, record label. Exactly. I said, what expenses? They loaned us, you know, yep. uh, a few thousand dollars to make the record. That's the only expenses I know of. They say, oh, no, no, they do promotion. They buy ads and magazines and yep. uh, 
ads on radio stations. And I said, oh, I see. So they said, you got to pay all that back before you actually start making money. Yeah. Very few bands very I know ever got to that point very that they sad. paid the record labels back. Very sad. There, there's a YouTube video on that where somebody broke it down and how much you actually make at the end, and it's it's horrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a good thing we love what we're doing because it never affected our performances. Most musicians I know from that period will go on stage regardless of what was happening in the business world Yeah, and just play with everything they had. Exactly. You know? Well, uh, Joe told me Frank Zappa was the one who talked you guys into going to California, right? He was one, yeah. yeah. Uh, Frank was one. Eric Burden was the other. Yep. And Eric actually was more of an influence. Uh, when we played with Zappa on opening night, uh, he came backstage and said to me, he says, I'm changing your name. You're no longer Mike Panera. I said, oh, really? What am I? <laughs> he, says, he says, your name from this point on is Mr. Ferocious because of the way you play guitar. <laughs> That's funny. And I, and I, you know, I mean, I... I uh, I mean, I loved Frank Zappa, and I love his mothers. I thought they were way ahead of their time. And for him to say that about us was really cool. Yeah. And he said, what you guys should do is pack it up and go out to L.A., because right. you're never going to make it really big here. You're yeah, doing well. Yeah. But uh, you got to go to L.A. to get signed. I said, okay. And he said, call me when you get there. And uh, we couldn't reach him when we got there, though. He was very busy and hard to find him. But Eric Burden, we were able to reach. Mm -hmm. And Eric said, yeah, yeah, I remember you guys. Come on down. I'm going to get you a gig at the Whiskey of Go-Go. And uh, you'll get discovered there. No doubt about it. You guys are so good. So Eric had his manager get us a gig at the Whiskey of Go-Go. Yep. And we played our signature blues, fusion, Latin, rock sound. And tore the place up. And we got signed shortly thereafter to Atlantic Records. Exactly. What Was that Kevin Devin? Was he the animal's manager at the time? Or? Yes. Yeah. He, he was their manager. Right. And in fact, uh, you know, uh, he was a bit of a thorn in our side because when we got there, uh, he said, yeah, I'm expecting you. Eric told me you guys were coming by. Let's make this quick, okay? I don't have a lot of time. He, that guy, he's a British right, uh, right. Uh, wit, you know, and uh, it was okay. We said, sure, here's our single. And so we put a 45 on, on the record player there, and it was called Can't You Believe in Forever. And it was a song that I had written back in uh, in Miami, and we had recorded it in Miami, too. It was like our, our first recording was Can't You Believe in Forever, right. with the B-side being Parchment Farm, a blues shuffle by Mos Allison. And so we played him Can't You Believe in Forever, and I don't think he even got to the end of the song. He said, I've heard enough. No, thank you. Thank you, but no thank you. I said, well, can't we talk about this? <laughs> I mean, Eric was sure that, that, you know, you'd like us and yeah. that we would get a deal. And he says, yeah, well, I'm not Eric. And, you know, there's the door. Nice, nice meeting you. Wow. And man, as they would have it, just as we were getting ready to go out that door, Eric comes walking in. Uh -huh. He said, he said, yeah, I heard you guys were here. I wanted to come by and say hello. And I said, great. He says, how's it going? We're going to book you guys, get you into the Whiskey of Gogo? I said, you better talk to your manager about that. He doesn't seem to like us very much. Jeez. So all I know is those were the days when the British musicians, they told their managers what to do. It right. wasn't their managers telling the artists what to do. Exactly. People like Eric, especially Eric Burton, I mean, yeah. my God, he was so original. And his songs just, you know, exuded, you know, rebel and uh, it's my life and I'll do what I want. I mean, <laughs> man, I said, God, this is the guy. And so sure enough, we went to the uh, Whiskey of Logo and played there. And um, uh, Lee Dorman, God yep. rest his soul, yeah. the Iron Butterfly, the bass player, yep. was in the audience. And he came up to us afterwards. He says, listen, I'm going to invite my managers to come see you. You know, we're the biggest group on Atlantic Records right now, so we have a lot of weight. We carry a lot of weight. And we'll get you signed. I said, okay, great. So sure enough, next time we played there, the managers were there. And they took us to see Atlantic Records, and we got signed. Awesome. Incredible. Yeah. Great story. Yeah, musicians, musicians helping musicians. Exactly. You know? That's the way it should be. That's the way it yeah. should be. <laughs> I got I to gotta ask you about uh, uh, your big hit, of course. Uh, the Fried Captain Ride, 1970. There's there's two, you know, uh, you know, explanations for the song. One, which is probably a rumor about the, the Pueblo 
uh, uh-huh. in North Korean waters that got busted. And this song was about, uh, you know, you had the 73 men on the Pueblo. And then, of course, the other was about the uh, staring at the, the keyboard. Uh, for, I guess, Frank's Fender Rhodes. And, yeah. Which is right. <laughs> They're both right. They're both right. right. What happened <laughs> when we were in the studio, American Recording Studio, with Richard Pobler, right. who, at that, who at that time was very popular as a producer. He was doing uh, Three Dog Night. He yep. was doing Steppenwolf. And, uh, you know, Born to be Wild, Magic Carpet Ride, One is the Loneliest Number. I mean, everything he was doing was going hit. And so um, our manager managed to talk him into taking us in, and he heard us play. He said, I don't know what to do with you guys. You're basically a blues band, and blues ain't user friendly on radio. And you know, we just listened and and said, yeah, but you know, we really play well and we have well sound. We can we can scale it down a little bit so it sounds a little more user friendly. He says, okay, let's see what you can do. And we started recording, and uh, everything was coming out like blues and jazz fusion and Latin uh, rock. And he said, man, I, I, I don't hear a hit here, and I don't think Atlantic's going to hear a hit. And unless we get something today that sounds like a hit, that I can call them and say, yep, they got one, we're recording it now, I think you guys are going to probably be dropped by the label. Jeez. And, you know, Steppenwolf was down the hall waiting for the studio to free up because they, they were next to come in. Right. And uh, got to meet them and we became friends. But what happened with Ride was I didn't have anything ready to go, and neither did anybody in the band. And I said, what are we going to do? We have to have something to record, like now, something written now. And Skip said, okay, well, listen, I do have this idea, okay? It goes, ride, Captain, ride upon your mystery ship. He says, that's it. I said, well, okay, I, I like the melody. I like the, you know, the uh, uh, the words. We just, let's get this thing done. So I was into meditation, and I studied meditation and fasting and all this stuff. So I was pretty high, naturally. <laughs> and I, I went into the... Uh, into the utility closet, shut the door, <laughs> and I just sat there and I just started writing and writing. And when I got out of there, ten minutes later, I had most of the song written, uh, melody-wise and lyrically. Uh, definitely, Skip had the, uh, uh, you know, the, the chords. Right, right. And so, so we had something. We definitely had something. So I went out to play for the producer, and I realized I didn't have a first verse. I didn't have an opening line. We have the rest of it, you know, be amazed at the friends you have here on your trip and, and, you know, all that, but no first verse. So I sat down at Skip's piano, and you're right, it was a model number 73. And the reason it was 73 is because it had 73 keys. Right. So Fender Rhodes, that was their premier piano, you know, the, the Rhodes Model 73. And it was big, and chrome, you know, it was like larger letters right there where the keys were. And I sat there and I said, hmm, oh, I can't think of any. And then I see 73 and I went, 73. <laughs> 73. I like the phonetics. I like the rhythm of those words. Very Tampa. Hey, 73, <laughs> man, 73. It just reminded me of Tampa a little bit. So I wrote down the word 73. And then it just started going from there. 73 men sailed up yep. from the San Francisco Bay and uh, rode off the ship. Here's what they had to say. Okay. It went to the record label later that day. It was played for the record label, and they said, this is it. This is going to be a hit. This is what we've been waiting for. So thank God we didn't lose our recording contract. And um, gosh, I don't know, probably two months later, it was released and zoomed up to number three in the nation. It was number one in a lot of regional markets, you know, big, big markets. But overall on Billboard, it was uh, number three. And so... We were just so jazzed about everywhere we went. You'd hear it on the radio, you mm-hmm. know, just everywhere. People calling me from Tampa, man, I heard you guys <laughs> on the radio. It was really great. But here's the weird thing that happened, Ray. My manager gets a call from the Pentagon. Oh, my God. And they said, yeah, from the Pentagon. And they said, we want to know how the guy that wrote the lyrics to this, Mike Panera, how he knew about the USS Pueblo <laughs> spy ship oh, that, sailed, that sailed out of San Francisco with approximately 73 men on it 
Uh, and uh, they definitely sailed off to history because they were captured by yeah, the Koreans yeah. and taken back to Korea. And in fact, the men are still there. They're they're being held hostage. And we want to know how Panera knew about it. And I got on the phone. I said, man, I had no idea about that. This is the first thing I hear about the USS Pueblo. I never even heard about that ship. And they said, oh, yeah, so the whole thing's a coincidence, right? The number of men, the place that it sailed out of, and the fact that it sailed on the history, that's all coincidence. <laughs> I said, man, you can call it whatever you want. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I guess I picked up some vibes somewhere. Yeah. And so that was it. They, the word went out that uh, in some way our song was connected with the USS Pueblo. And I tell you, Ray, the funny thing about that was, uh, as time went by uh, and I was on the road, people from the Pueblo that were on the Pueblo, the crew, right. would come up at our concerts and say, hey, man, I was on the Pueblo. I was one of the crew guys. Thanks for writing that song for us, man. <laughs> I said, sure, sure, brother. I said, but I wrote it for everybody. That's great. I said, you guys. Well, it was like that for years to come. But the, the, the high point was, this guy shows up at one of my gigs and says, I want to tell you something. I'm probably the only guy, the only person who knows why your third verse says, <laughs> no one heard them calling. Uh -huh. No no one came at all. Right. Because they were too busy watching those old raindrops fall. Right. I said, really? You know what that means? Well, tell me, because I never figured it out. <laughs> I'd like to know what I was saying. And he says, well, here's the thing. I was the radio control operator wow. for the Pueblo. I was the guy who did all the control uh, radio transmissions. And when the Koreans started heading for us to capture us, he said, I started going mayday, mayday, and sending out emergency radio transmissions. But there was a huge storm about blowing. Huh out of sea and so the radio transmissions wouldn't go through wow. you know the the storm was holding everything down so nobody heard us calling for help no one came at all i said oh i get it because they were too busy watching those raindrops wow. oh oh okay now i know thank uh, you and that was the peak to an otherwise uh yeah. odd story you must have had some kind of psychic connection or something there man <laughs> Well, you know, sometimes uh, meditation and fasting, you know, yeah. can produce some awesome results sometimes. But um, yeah, I kind of think, well, yeah, seventy-three men. I, I think the real total was like seventy-seven or something. Right. But uh, it was the San Francisco Bay, and and it wow. uh, it certainly did go up to history. And the boat is still there in yeah. Korea at their naval museum, the huh. USS Pueblo. What I didn't like was they captured the crew yeah. and kept them there for one year wow. under very strenuous uh, circumstances. Yeah. And a lot of those guys now, you know, in their 70s and yeah. 80s, and they have these reunions, and I see it all the time, you know, the crew of the Pueblo. And I was thinking, you know, maybe one day I'll resurrect uh, a tour. That would be great. And we'll go out and, yeah. uh, and we'll say this is a tour as a tribute to the members of the USS Pueblo. And maybe we can stir up enough uh, trouble to get uh, the powers that be in Washington to say, "Hey, we got to get those, we got to get that boat back, and we got to, we got to pay tribute to the crew members and that were there for one year uh, with limited water and food and stuff. That uh, some of them died. God, mm -hmm. God rest their souls. But yeah, that's that's the thing. That, that was a story with Rod Captain, and you know, to this day, Ray, it's still one of the most played songs." On it radio, is. it is the satellite radio yeah. and uh, and all that stuff, and and in the movies, it's been in uh, Anchorman yeah. and uh, uh, Mick Jagger and Martin Scorsese's weekly series of uh, vinyl. It was featured there, and I was really happy that it was featured in a good way. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the the message in the story was real nice. <laughs> Especially in Anchorman, where the other the other radio station guys are threatening to kill him. His girlfriend has left him. His dog was captured by some motorcycle guy and thrown over the Golden Gate Bridge into the water. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's pretty sad up to there. And then all of a sudden, the soundtrack starts playing Ride, Captain Ride. Played the whole song. And the dog comes running back all wet. The girlfriend comes running back. I'm sorry. I love you. <laughs> and the guy who was going to kill him said, I'm sorry. Can you ever forgive me? I 
and I said, apart from murdering you, it's a real high point to see Rod Captain Ride being played as the plot resolved. <laughs> well, you know, one of my favorite videos is that video with John Biner introducing you guys. I mean, I, oh, yeah. I, I can watch that video over and over again because, of course, Joe's in there and you're s singing the song, and it, it just fits so well. It's so great. You know, you guys on the rocks with the water in the background. I love it. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I had left the band. I was I was already out of the band for a couple of weeks. I was already in the Iron Butterfly. Uh -huh. And so the guy, the guy that you see on that rock who's uh, lip syncing to my voice, you know, it's it's my voice that, that you're hearing, right. but it's him mouthing it with his lips. Uh, Danny Coriel. Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. I had no idea. Huh. Yep. Rest in peace. Wow. Danny Coriel was the guy up on that rock singing. And uh, a lot of people, you know, come up and go, God, you look different. Yeah, yeah. Back then, I said, well, no, that, that wasn't me, but it was me singing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they just had the Rose Bowl parade out here. Uh-huh. And, and, uh, they had, uh, a float. Trader Joe's created a float called the Ride Captain Ride Float. And, uh, they played it through their big PA, uh, on the float as they went up and down with the other floats up and down the streets of, uh, Pasadena. And, uh, so we were featured in the Rose Bowl Parade. I heard later that it was aired live in 140 countries. Hmm. And they heard Ride Captain Ride, uh, live with my voice and uh so now i do all my shopping at trader joe's <laughs> <laughs> that's loyalty man <laughs> yeah yeah and i play sawtooth guitars man <laughs> let me tell you one day i'll just you know i'll tune well maybe next tuesday when i go to do the, the yeah uh, sure the show at three i'll call you to give you a reminder okay or email you all right and uh you'll hear these guitars with tones yep and I, the guitar, they, the first guitar that they have uh, given to me is a hybrid. There's no other guitar like this in the world. It hasn't been released to the public yet. And uh, I think you'll like it. It's got a great sound. And uh, when you see seven pickups on there, seven makes you pickups. think, wow. That's what is incredible. This guitar capable of doing. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I play a little guitar, so I know a little bit about guitar. I've always been a Fender guy. Oh. Uh, I had a uh, 73 Tele, and I ended up selling it. Oh. Yeah, I, I had. you should have saw the autographs I had on that, man. Alvin Lee, Eric Burden. Oh, oh man. Wow. <laughs> All the guys from Humble Pie. But you oh, know what? I, I, I wrote my first book, and I needed the money, so I, I said it's either a book or a guitar, and I sold the guitar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah, that's yeah. good. I miss it well, though. <laughs> I'll have uh, I'll have to invite you to jam with me live online too. You oh, know, you know, the new technologies that are out there for uh, bringing in different players from different locations and all playing in real time at the same time. I'd be embarrassed to play with you, man. <laughs> oh, no. Play some good old blues, man. The oh stuff yeah, I love blues. On, you know, I the... love blues. That's one thing I can do is I can play a little blues. Yeah. Great. Great. <laughs> You know, I heard Blues Image and Iron Butterfly were both supposed to play at Woodstock, right? Uh, no, just Butterfly. Oh, just Butterfly. I, th I thought yeah, Blues Butterfly. Image was invited, too. We had done a lot of shows together. Right. Iron Butterfly and Blues Image were playing shows around the country at that time. Right. Big, big pop festivals. And uh, I got to play twice, you know, go on with Blues Image and then go on with Iron Butterfly. And, uh, you know, we did the Miami Pop Festival, but... We did one in San Francisco, the San Francisco Music Festival, and that had Led Zeppelin, Eric Burden, Chambers Brothers, Blues Image, yeah. Iron Butterfly. All the greats. Uh, Ten years after, Jefferson Airplane, Santana, must have been 20 artists. Uh, you should have seen the, the dressing room on that show, bro. <laughs> uh, <laughs> everybody trying to find a seat. Oh, but, uh, yeah, it was great. It was great playing in both bands. But eventually, uh, yeah, I slid out and, um, and, you know, just went with the butterfly and they replaced me with two excellent musicians, Denny Coriel, singer, right. yeah. and Kent Henry, guitar player, both of whom have passed away. But, uh, they were so good and blues them, it sounded real good. But again, my prediction of the record labels and the manager yeah. saying, yeah. hey man, you guys, you can't spend any time with your family. You yeah. have to get right back to the studio right. and right back on the road. Seeing as that I was the main songwriter, it, it became extra hard for them. So a lot of a lot of tension, and then Blues Image broke up. 
we, we uh, you know, I'm actually in the Sarasota area. You know, I'm oh, I'm about 45 right. minutes from Tampa, but I, I worked in Tampa area for um, for for a long, long time doing as a music journalist. I covered you know Ruth Eckerd Hall and and all the yeah. big all the big concert venues around here. Uh, but you know, locally, you know, of course, we had uh, Larry Rhino Reinhardt. He, he was from Bradenton, a Bradenton native, yes. and he was a big hero here. So was uh, Dan Toller, another big, you know, guy. Sure, here. Marshall Tucker Band. Marshall yeah. Tucker Band, and of course, Dickie Betts lives here, and uh, yep, and also Rick Derringer. He lives really close to me here. So, yeah, that's of, right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, a lot of cool musicians, you know, from Florida. You know. Oh, God, for sure. And, you know, speaking of uh, Dickie Betts, uh, when Blues Image was playing at uh, at Dino's nightclub in Tampa when we first got together, and we were doing, um, you know, the blues format with the two drummers and all that, these guys walked in, three guys, and said, hey, we're the Almond Joy, man. We're from Bradenton. Right. I said, oh, that's a, that's a cool band. That's a cool name, man, the Almond Joy. So it's Dickie Betts, Greg Almond, and Dwayne Almond. Mm-hmm. Got the rest of their show. Yeah. And they came in, and after the thing was over, after our set was over, they came up and said, what was that shuffle you opened up with, man? <laughs> I said, oh, that's Don't Want You No More by Spencer Davis. So this sounded huge with the two drummers. I said, yeah, yeah, it's a great song. And so then we had another one that I had written that was very Latin pop that went, dun, da, 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 You'll hear that on our, on our uh, Blues Image album. And uh, so I see that the Almond Joy had turned into the Almond Brothers, and their first album contained a song called Don't Want You No More by Spencer Davis. And, uh, you know, they did, of course, they did a great job of, of uh, recording that song. But that was another example of Bradenton and Tampa, yep. Sarasota, players all together. And a, a very funny thing involving Sarasota happened, and not too many people know this, I formed a band called the Classic Rock All-Stars. Oh, of course. So, yeah. Yeah. And that had, that had Pete Rivera, the yep. drummer and singer of Rare Earth. Love Pete. Jerry Corbetta, yep. keyboard player, founder, singer of Sugarloaf. Yep. And, uh, you know, a bunch of guys. And uh, so... I formed the band, and so I said, okay, guys, I'm so glad that you're up for this idea. We'll go up on stage and back each other up on our hits and, and our best-known songs. And then Pete said, well, when's the first gig? I said, well, gee, gee Pete, I haven't booked anything yet. I, I figured we want to rehearse at least one time before I uh, accepted a gig from an agent. And he said, no, man. He said, I don't rehearse unless there's a gig. Unless there's a, you know, that, that Detroit style of beat. Yeah. He said, I'm sorry, man. I, I don't play any gigs. <laughs> and I do any rehearsal unless there's some gigs. So I said, okay, hang on. I called the Temptations manager, and I said, listen, we, we're the Blues Image, and I'm forming this band called the Classic Rock All-Stars. One of the guys doesn't want to play uh, a rehearsal unless there's a gig. Now, I love the Sarasota Fairgrounds, and I love the fact that some friends of ours have a charity there for yep. muscular dystrophy, yep. and we'd like to help with that. So why don't we do something called the Winter Festival, or the Winter Time, and starring the Temptations, and they'll bring the people in, and then they'll get to hear the classic rock off stars also. And I can go ahead and book some rehearsals. So we got that together. So our very first show, Ray, was there at the Sarasota yep. Fairgrounds. Yep. And we did the, the Temptations did their set. Wow. And we came on and did uh, classic rock off stars. <laughs> and people heard all those hits, and they were freaked out. In the audience was Dickie Betts, mm -hmm. Patrick Moraz, who's been on sure. your show he, from he, Moody Blues. Yeah, yeah. And yes. Yep. Yeah, he, he was out there. Yeah. Mickey Dolans was out in the audience. Huh. And also, um, Bob Scott. Yeah. Of, uh, a, of, uh, ACDC. Yeah, yeah. They just all happened to be in the area and they heard it over the radio and huh. said, let's go see these guys. Wow. So we had so many stars there. I mean, it, the Caps finale picture looks like a who's who of classic rock. And, uh, that was our first show that we ever did. And I asked Spencer to stay on and I asked Mickey Dolan to stay on. So the very first version of the Classic Rock All-Stars, most people don't know, has Spencer Davis, Mickey Dolan, yep. 
Cherry Corbetta, P. Rivera, Dennis Nota of Cannibal and Headhunters, so, and yours truly. Yeah. That was our first gig. Yeah, that's that's the that's gig is only 10 minutes from me here. Yeah, what, what year was that? Do you know? That was 1992. Okay, I wasn't here yet. I was still in D.C. I, uh-huh. Yeah, that, that's why I, I... We moved here about 17 years ago, but... Yeah, I, I'm sorry I missed that, man. I would have, I would have definitely been there. <laughs> well, I tell you, you, you got a piece. Of, you, some of the things we've been discussing here are, yep. are being discussed for the first time. Exactly. So you're getting some, uh, some scoops. <laughs> and, and, and then the original All Stars, you guys probably broke up that band because two guys passed away. Uh, Dennis and uh, Jerry, you know, left us. Yeah. And then, but you did you did reform some other guys. Are you still doing that? Are you still on the road with the, the new guys? No, nope. Uh, same kind of thing happened there. Right. I called my friend Goldie and John, right. the founder of Steppenwolf, Steppenwolf right, and the, and the keyboardist. So he came in, and he has since passed away. Right. Um, the uh, the bass player was Prescott Niles of the Knack. Okay. And he was real good. Yep. And the drummer was Albert Bouchard, the drummer and founder of Blue Oyster Cult. Wow. So that was the classic rock all stars version two. We went out and did a bunch of gigs, but it never quite caught on, uh-huh. probably because I was singing all the songs. Okay. Those guys were in those bands, right. but they were not the lead singers. So, you know, we're doing uh, Don't Fear the Reaper, and, and we're doing uh, My Sharon and all that. And I'm singing them one after the other, uh-huh. and it, it wasn't like going to see the first version where Pete would sing Real Earth and Jerry would sing Sugar Loaf, you know, all the original singers. Those all-star bands are so popular now. I mean, I mean, you got uh, Happy Together tour, you know, with yeah. Flo and Eddie. You got Ringo and his All Stars. I mean, they're yep. they're all huge, you know. It's true. Yeah, that's very true. And uh, well, we've got a lot of guys that you know call me all the time. Uh, well-known names that want to do a, a version of Classic Rock All Stars with us. You should. And uh, so we might, <laughs> you know, we might have something. Uh, to surprise everybody with uh, this summer. Hell, you know everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even Alice Cooper did the thing with uh, Johnny Depp. <laughs> you know. Well, that's right. Yeah. And I, uh, I, I put a um, an interview of Alice uh, that was just released a couple of weeks ago. Really? And, yeah, yeah. And uh, so I put it on my Facebook timeline. And uh, the guy is, uh, the interviewer says to Alice, well, you just played uh, this evening with your band, the Special Forces, and uh, you had 40,000 people at Joe Louis Arena. How does that all feel? Uh, and Alice says, oh, it's great. You know, it's great. We, we love to play. And, uh, and then out of nowhere, the guy says, and he's a very well-known interviewer, he says, let me ask you something. It's been told that out of all the people that have played in your bands, there's only one guy that you're scared of, and that's Mike Panera. <laughs> is, is that true, Alice? He says, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm scared to death of him, man. <laughs> and, you know, tongue-in-cheek. And, and so he says, and why is that? He says, well, Mike is like the Mr. Rogers of rock and roll. <laughs> he'll, he'll come up to you and go, Hello. I'm Mike. How you doing, Alice? How are you feeling tonight? <laughs> oh, good. We're going to have a great show. He says, and I always have a feeling, he's smiling so much all the time, that he's got some butcher knives behind his back, you know, that he's going to pull out any minute and start chopping at me. That's funny. Of course, he, he had a good laugh on that. Yeah. And um, he said, no, I've, I've known Mike since the late 60s. You know, we've been friends a long time. It's good to have him. He says, you know, he plays the guitar with his teeth. Did you know that? <laughs> the guy says, oh, yeah, I heard. I heard that he does do that. And so it's, it's a very healthy interview. Yeah. Uh, it's two hours long, so if you don't want to hear the whole two hours, when he starts talking about me, it's like five minutes <laughs> in. And, uh, and he says, yeah, I like beating Mike up on stage. You know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful feeling. He definitely is the Mr. Rogers of rock That's and roll. That's funny. That's funny. I've been called a lot of things, Ray. I've <laughs> never Mr. been called Rogers. that before. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, I try to get Alice uh, on the show many times. I, I just can't reach him for some reason. I, I've had all most of his band on the show, you know, yeah. but not not Alice. Uh, I'll still keep well, trying. <laughs> yeah, keep trying. And yeah. Try his manager, Shep. Yep. If you if you haven't already, 
and uh, maybe Shep can, you know, move it along a little bit for you. Well, you know, I figure now's a good time to get a hold of these guys because, you know, it, yeah. they got plenty of time to talk, you know. That's right. Yeah. And, and they're wanting to, you know. I mean, there's a lot of guys online right now. Exactly. Doing uh, John Mayer, I just watched him do something, and uh, Keith Urban watched him do something. Yep. And they got great mixes, you know. They're into their recording consoles, and the console goes into the camera. And it just sounds great, looks great. So... Hopefully, people will be treated to a lot of great free oh, yeah. concerts online. Exactly, you got to look for them. Exactly, you, you know, Ramatam was a great band. It's a, it's 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 a shame that it didn't last long because you know one one song I like was Whiskey Place, and yeah. there's, there's a lot of comments that you sounded like Tom Jones. <laughs> you know, I hear that sometimes. <laughs> People say, you sound a lot like Todd and Jones or other songs, <laughs> Butterfly Blue yeah. by, uh, by Iron Butterfly Metamorphosis. Right. Um, That's a good yeah, thing. That's I, good I thing. wish it would have lasted longer. Yeah. Problem was is that uh, April, uh, she wasn't in, in the best of health. Right. Poor thing. She was very fragile. And the record label pulling the old thing of putting us out there for, you know, six nights in a row with one night off and and we're playing with 10 years after and Emerson Lake and Palmer yeah. and a lot of great bands uh, and you know she just started to where she was going to the hospital a lot from really? the road yeah. and we just couldn't continue but Mitch and I had a great time because we had um, we had gotten a house in Long Island New York Huntington Bay uh, up on a hill looking down at the uh, the cut you know with all the sailboats coming in yep. and it was like 10, 10 bedrooms and it had a ballroom in it, and uh, the record label donated it for us. They rented it for us. And uh, so Mitch and I would get up, and we'd go in that ballroom, man, with all those acoustics, and play guitar and drum stuff. That that should have been the album. But, yeah. you know, instead there was uh, those other songs. But, yeah, Whiskey Place, the, the guitar harmonies, and a lot of the things that April and I were doing yeah. were very innovative in uh, that time period. I agree. Uh, and people can definitely still get that album on Amazon or download wherever you get downloads from, and that's Ramatam. And uh, uh, Mitch Mitchell, man, what a legend! I yeah. mean, you know, the drummer from Jimi Hendrix. Holy mackerel! Exactly. I, I, I was uh, We had a lot of fun because we go places like in Miami. You know, mm -hmm. we show up at a at a big uh, nightclub or something to jam with whoever was playing, and. Uh, the next day, I'd read an article in the Miami Herald that says, well, my parents showed up to jam with uh, Wayne Cochran and the C.C. Rogers last night. He had some guy with him who he thought was Mitch Mitchell. Uh -huh. This guy was telling everybody he was Mitch Mitchell. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I said, I just thought, what do you mean? It was Mitch Mitchell. What are you talking about, dude? <laughs> I, just, I just left it alone, you know? And course, uh, you guys had a pretty good producer there with Tom Dow also. Tom Dow, yeah. the legendary. That's incredible. Absolutely. Another song I yeah. like was Can't Sit Still. That was another good tune. Can't Sit Still was yeah. another great tune. Another great tune. Great band. Thank you so much, Ray. Thank great you. band, man. Uh, I got two more questions for you. One is, why don't you think that you reached the heights of like Clapton, Page, Beck, Santana, and, and you got that PR like those guys did? Because you certainly were uh, either just as good or better than those guitarists. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, the British have always had a flair for right. publicity, for media, right. uh, and everything. Um, I mean, look at Pink Floyd, you know. Yeah, they disappear for a while, they come back, and they're playing for 50,000 people yeah. in arenas with uh, flying pigs, balloons, and stuff. <laughs> they just, uh, you know, they really have a flair for publicity and PR, and Deep Purple, a lot of the bands that have uh, reunited, they make the managers make sure that there's a big publicity push on it. I would have to say the the easy answer is that's just the way it was. It was meant right. to be. It wasn't a statement about who could play better than who and all that. It was just, uh, you know, if you did enough big gigs and you had a good publicity agent, you could uh, really uh, move forward. Uh, I'll give you an example here in L.A., in 1970, Blues Image played with The Who right. at Anaheim Stadium. Yep. And I think that, that was, you know, maybe 30,000 people or something. And uh, nobody nobody knew about it. Nobody heard about it. It was just on the poster. It said The Who at Anaheim Stadium with open 
Morning Guest Blues Image or when uh, Led Zeppelin was the opening band for Iron Butterfly yeah we went on tour yeah, I... and uh, god what a trip I saw Jimmy you know, and Jimmy says hey, what says that we're opening for you guys I said I don't know anything about that <laughs> <laughs> I wish we, we should definitely be opening for you <laughs> and he says oh well it's okay it's okay we'll, we'll, we'll both do well yeah and I think you know the, with the right publicity that would have went out yep. saying Led Zeppelin opening for Iron Butterfly uh there's a lot that could be done in getting the word out that uh, I was playing with these bands. Same thing with the guitar talk box yeah, that you mentioned. Exactly. Yeah. You know, um, we were in the uh, studio cutting Metamorphosis, Iron Butterfly, and the inventor, the original inventor, came up to me and said, "Try this. See what you think." I said, "It looks like a water, a water bag, you know, with a tube." Mm -hmm. And he says, "Yeah, but." But just put it on and I'll plug it into your amp to watch what happens. He put it there and all of a sudden my speakers were disconnected and the sound was coming up the tube into my mouth. And he says, just talk. You should, you know, shape your lips like you're talking. And I went, hello, baby. <laughs> well, I played the note and it was a guitar talking saying, hello, baby. <laughs> I said, oh, let me try this. I got the blues about my baby. <laughs> And I did that while playing the guitar, and it sounded like the guitar talking. So I said, I love this. Can I use it? He says, yeah. So I said, I'll give you some tips if I can think of anything. After having the, uh, after using it, the first use of that guitar talk box, which at that point, it was called the Magic Bag, uh -huh. until Custom Electronics bought it. Uh, and it hung around your shoulder, the fringe. Really? And the two. Yeah, that, that was the original one. And uh, after using it for about a week, <clears throat> I went back to the inventor and I said, I got some tips, I got some ideas for you. He said, go ahead, man, you know, I'll include you as a co-inventor. I said, no, 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 you've already invented it. I'll just give you some notes. I said, you know, it's not loud enough. The sound coming up the tube is not loud enough. You have to work really hard right. for the enunciation with your lips. I said, so why don't you take the driver that you have? You know, you have in there, which is a little speaker like that. I said, make it a bigger speaker, give it more power, and aim that up the tube and see what happens. So he did that. And, oh, and one other thing. I said, instead of the roadies having to go back to the back of your amp and unplugging it from the speaker jack and then putting the, your speaker jack back in, why don't you put a little switch? That'll right. switch it right. from the talk box into the speakers uh, on the amp. Yep. He said, those are great ideas. I'll use it. So that's it. I used it on Metamorphosis. It came out. And people were raving about it and saying, yeah. wow, man, mm -hmm. I, I just heard this incredible sound. It's called the Magic Bag. Then it became the Guitar Talk Box. Funny story was, I ran into Jeff Beck in the recording studio. Uh -huh. Carmine of Peace was there, yep. and uh, they were forming Beck, Bogart, and Apathy, yep. and uh, Jeff says, Mike, what's that thing you have there? I said, oh, yeah, I'll show you, and I played some notes on it, and he says, oh, my gosh, Mike, could I just borrow that for a couple of weeks? <laughs> just a couple of weeks, that's all. I said, yeah, sure, but i got to get it back, because I'm going out on tour in a couple of weeks. He said, okay, and Carmine looked at me and kind of smiled, like, you're never going to see that thing again. <laughs> he said, I better give it back to you. And I just, you know, I just bypassed that. Well, two weeks later, no magic bag back. Oh, man. A month later, today, I still have not gotten that magic bag, yeah. talk box back from Jeff Beck. That, that sounds like Jeff and, Beck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so I said, wow, man, what, what's with this guy? So I, uh, I called him up one day, and I said, Jeff, what are you doing with the thing? You know, he was supposed to get it back to me by now. He says, oh, Mike, I've made so many modifications oh, to it. Gosh. I couldn't possibly return it to you now. Oh, I've done so many things to it. I said, oh, okay. Okay, Jeff, fine. You keep it with your modifications and uh, see you down the road. So I've joked about it plenty of times during my career that Jeff Beck, I won't use the word stole, but uh, <laughs> he did. Jeff Beck, took, Jeff Beck <laughs> took my talk box and didn't return it. <laughs> you know, you you should have taken that credit as co-inventor. You know that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's true. I guess you know the people that matter. You know, uh, yeah. 
Peter Frampton uh, heard Jeff playing it, and then he started playing it. And people think that Peter Frampton was the first guy. Well, Joe, Joe Walsh. Joe and, Walsh. Yeah, yeah, Walsh. Yeah. And then, uh, and then uh, Joe uh, Perry. Right. On uh, Aerosmith. Right. And, uh, yeah, it started uh, coming into its own light, and then uh, they changed the shape of it from a bag to uh, a little pedal on right. the floor that you push the button with your foot, and that changes the speaker. So it's cool. But I thought you, you should know that story because not too many people know that. Well, should I make my headline for this interview that Mike Panera is the inventor of the talk box? <laughs> well, actually, I was the, I was the co-inventor. All right, co-inventor. And, yeah, yeah, but you yeah, did the modifications. I, I didn't want to take... Huh? You did the modifications, you know. <laughs> I did the modifications. That's right. Yeah. I uh, I came up with the ideas. That's right. To modify it to give it a better sound, yeah. and that's why you can hear it uh, so clear when Frampton goes, "Do you feel like I do?" Yeah. And all that. It's real yeah. clear. But if you go to Metamorphosis album and go to Butterfly Blue, yep. And listen. Great album. To my free my free form jam. You'll hear stuff like "Don't bring me down." Yeah, it's awesome. As I detune, yeah, detune it while I'm talking. Some unusual uses of the talk box. Yeah, Frampton sure. comes alive was successful because of that talk box. <laughs> oh, he's, he's such a talented guy. Yeah. He was so cute back then with his curly blonde hair. And uh, yeah. you know, I got I got to thank Frampton because the day that I got married uh -huh. to my beautiful wife Valerie, who's yeah. still here, yeah. Um, she, uh, 1973, it was, and we got married that day, and uh, I was supposed to play the Miami Baseball Stadium opening for Fram uh, for Peter Frampton. Right. And uh, I said to the promoter, I said, man, I don't know how this thing got mixed up, but they got our wedding scheduled for that time. I, I'm, I got to be in church getting married at the time that you have me set to play here. And he says, well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? I said, let me go talk to Peter. I said, Peter, would you mind going on a little earlier so that I can go get married? <laughs> then I'll come back and I'll finish the set. He said, sure, Mike, sure. <laughs> it's easy. Yeah. Said, you know, just just uh, enjoy yourself and happy wedding and all that stuff. And so I went and got married. Mm -hmm. Thanks yeah. to Peter uh, allowing me to uh, to be late for my set. That was nice. That was nice. You know, you're 100 percent right about the Brit guitars getting more PR. Um, yeah. Some other guys that were monster guitarists, uh, you know, Frank Marino, and also yep. and also, um, I'm losing my my train of thinking here. Uh, oh, um, Tommy Bolin, you know, which you yeah. know he did get an opportunity to play with Deep Purple, you know, at the time. But another great guitar player that. Probably didn't get enough PR as well, you know, for, yeah. for, for, for his talent. That's true. So you are 100 percent right true. on that. But but Mike Panera, when I was growing up, you were the man. I mean, that, that's all we heard about the the, the the great guitar player Mike Panera. You know, as I was oh, so I remember a lot of PR about you growing up and how how big and how what a great guitar player you you were and and still are today. Thank you, Ray. I appreciate that very much. Yeah, man. Mike, here's your final question, all right? Yes, huh? <clears throat> and I get a lot of interesting answers from people. Uh, it, it's going to be tough for you because you know everybody in the business, but if you had a Field of Dreams wish, like in the movie, uh, to perform, collaborate with anyone from the past or present, who would that be? Well, uh, God, there's so many people. I know. Does it matter if they're still alive? No, I mean, no, no. They, if they passed away, they could, uh, they could have. They could be passed away. They, it could be okay. Mozart. <laughs> then, in that case, my dream list would be Jimi Hendrix, right? George Harrison, okay. Um, uh, let's see, John Bonham. Yep. And thank goodness I got to play with John before he passed away. Yeah. And J and Jimmy. I uh, didn't get to play with George Harrison. Um, also, uh, you know, um, Chaco Pastorius. Chaco, yeah. Face, Incredible. Florida boy. Yeah. Uh, definitely Greg Allman, you know. Uh, we had great jams. And Dwayne Allman. Yeah. We had great jams together. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I have a list of... I could probably give you about, you know, a couple of dozen names of people that I wish I could be playing with uh, or had recorded with or whatever, but uh, uh, 
you know, most of those guys are gone. Yeah. And I feel terribly bad about that. I know. Glenn Fry was a good friend, and I, I thought he was very talented also. And uh, Tom Petty. Yeah. Again, Another you know, Florida guy. Teach, but yeah. very talented. Yeah. So that's a good question. I've never been asked that. And, yeah. Uh, you know, maybe uh, maybe I'll go license some of their songs and we'll put it on one album and uh, that'd be cool. And you know, do do some uh, a tribute or something integrated playing. Yeah, yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Um, oh, and Paul McCartney. Oh, and Paul McCartney. Did, have you met any of the guys from the Beatles? Uh, yeah, just briefly though. Right, right. Just very, very briefly. Yeah. Now, uh, now, now you actually it, played with you, you. Did you jam with Hendrix? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, what was that like? <laughs> a number of times. Oh, that was mind-boggling. That was, you know, to be sitting there playing at a, at a nightclub in Hollywood called The Experience. Yeah. P-H-E-E. And in walks Jimi Hendrix, you know, with his entourage, a bunch of people. And uh, he sits down very politely. He's looking up at us and he's nodding his head. And I just said, do you want to play? You, you know, I uh, motion to the guitar. And he said, sure. So he came up. And I just remembered, God, he's left-handed. I wonder if he's going to be able to do this with a right-handed guitar. No problem. He played it, played extremely well. And uh, I was wondering what we were going to play. Because, you know, most times, as you know, Ray, being a guitar player, you go to jam with somebody, and you go, well, what do you want to play? And they'll usually name a song. Yep. They'll say, oh, let's do Rock Me Baby, or let's right. do Crossroads, or Johnny Be Good. Mm -hmm. Usually it's based around a jam around a song yep. that everybody knows. Right. But not so with Jimmy. Jimmy would come up, he'd look at me, and, you know, just kind of get serious for a minute, start tapping his foot, and then he'd start playing some rhythm thing. You know, mostly, mostly yeah. funky he would start off with. Yeah. Then I'd join in, and then before you know it, Blues Image would join in. And then one night, Jim Morrison came up in the middle of a jam with Jimmy. Wow. And, uh, you know, picked up his blues harp and played uh, like a John Lee Hooker kind of... <laughs> so Jimmy was great at everything. Blues, fusion, psychedelic. <laughs> and... Uh, the biggest thing that I was able to take out of all that was that we became friends. Yeah. The band, Blues Image, and I were invited uh, on numerous occasions to his house uh, over in Beverly Hills, mm -hmm. California. You, you didn't record so, any of those jam sessions, did you? Uh, I don't have any with me. I, I, I don't have access to them, yeah. but I'm told that they exist. Well, that'd be something, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think maybe one day somebody might say, hey, man, by the way, I... I got that jam of you and Hendrix yeah. from uh, from L.A. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, that would be great to, to be able to resurrect those jams. I had, and I, they're in my heart, bro, I tell you. Yeah. I'll never forget Jimmy as a person, as a friend, a gentleman, yep. and a great, innovative player. The, 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 there will never be another Jimmy Hendrix. You know, he had his own style. Sure. Yeah, he really yeah. did. Mike, anything well, else you'd like to promote or chat about? Uh, no, just, uh, you know, for everybody to be safe during these periods. Yeah. And uh, um, check out Sawtooth Guitars, sawtooth.com, okay. and uh, see what I'm playing nowadays. And uh, incredible stuff. Uh, I think you can access the show that I did yesterday, actually. Right. Uh, Mike Panera live from his porch right here with the, uh, I'm holding my phone up on camera so that later on I'll send you the uh, video okay. of this. And, uh, yeah, Sawtooth, uh, the most incredible music instruments on the planet. And then there's also, you know, some foundations here like Oasis uh, and Hubbard Media that are helping the homeless, the poor and the needy to have food. These are people that sleep under piers and yeah. bridges and stuff. And yeah. he goes out there every day and feeds them. So hmm. look on the web, you know, okay. on, on, the, on the Internet for Hubbard Media or Oasis Networking. And uh, donate a dime or donate whatever you can. Help them out to feed the people that need feeding. And that's about it. That's all I'd like to promote right now. And uh, for the kids out there that think uh, they need to get stoned to play right, I would just say, no, you don't. Yeah. Say, uh, take it from me, from a veteran who's been there and done that. <laughs> and I, I stopped doing everything in 1988. Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, I try to caution the kids 
You don't need to do that to be a great player. Just practice and be around other great musicians uh, and get that contact high. Exactly. That'll do it. I got you. Mike, thank you so much, man, for being on the show today. Uh, I hope you come back to Florida soon after this is all over. Yes, absolutely. That's that's one of our first places we're going to go to. Awesome. We, yeah, we miss you here. <laughs> oh, thank you, Ray. Thank you, Mike. And we're looking forward to seeing you again on your live shows. And uh, please stay in touch, man. You got it. All right. Take thank care. You. All right. Okay. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. <laughs> Purchase Timeless by the Blues Image featuring Mike Panera at Amazon.com. 70 classic rock heroes Blues Image returned with his superb collection of recently recorded favorites and new song. Blues Image founder Mike Panera showcases both his past accomplishments with the fantastic new renditions of the blockbuster single Ride Captain Ride and Iron Butterflies in Agata de Vida as well as his present skills as a songwriter on such tunes as Love is the Answer, Pay My Dues, and more. Includes guest performances by blues rock legends uh, Pat Travers and Journey's Jonathan Kane. For more information about Mike Pinera, visit www.theclassicrockallstars.com, www.facebook.com, backslash Mike Pinera Official, and also www.solarisartist.com, backslash exclusive uh, artist backslash Mike Panera. Very special thanks to the dynamic duo, of course, of Doug and Don Newsom of BBS Radio for making the magic happen for each and every broadcast of Interviewing the Legends. If you have comments or suggestions for the show, contact me at interviewingthelegends at gmail.com. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Interviewing the Legends with Ray Shasho for the very latest interviews. It's real news. And, of course, my new book is finally out, entitled The Rockstar Chronicles Series 1. It chronicles truths, confessions, and wisdom from the music legends that set us free, featuring over 45 intimate conversations with some of the greatest rock legends on the planet. Order yours today on hardcover or ebook at bookbaby.com or amazon.com. Everybody stay safe, stay home. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for listening to Interviewing the Legends. Brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call 941 877 1552 or visit us at publicityworksagency.com specializing in author and music artist publicity plans we shine when we make you shine tune in to interviewing the legends every tuesday at 7 p.m pacific time on bbs radio station one